On a May day of 878, King Alfred of Wessex marches determinedly towards the clash that may decide both his destiny and the survival of his kingdom. Alfred roars his own encouragement, raising the spirits of the nearby feared, while insults and war cries are exchanged from two solid shield walls that inch ever closer towards the bloody struggle. The battle was about to begin. Before we continue, I want to welcome back a returning sponsor, CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream offers award-winning and original documentary film, shows, and series that you can't find anywhere else. Their ever-growing library of content spans science, nature, history, technology, military history, music, food, and more. CuriosityStream has something for everyone. With plans starting at under $5 a month, you get access to thousands of hours of high-quality documentaries and series, and with both monthly and annual plans available, you can choose the plan that works best for you and your budget. CuriosityStream is available on TV, computer, or mobile devices, making it easy to watch your favorite documentaries anytime, anywhere. CuriosityStream is one of those rare platforms that offer great educational value. Their history documentaries are informative and engaging, and will surely expand your knowledge on a variety of topics. I recently watched 16 Days in Berlin, an excellent 18-episode series that follows the Soviet siege of Berlin in 1945. Another great series is The Bastions of Power that describes what life was like behind the walls of some of the most imposing medieval castles. Best yet, CuriosityStream drops new content every week. As of now, I've been their subscriber for over five years, and I highly recommend them. With CuriosityStream, you get excellent value for money. So, if you'd like to help us produce more free content like this, signing up for CuriosityStream is a great way to do so. Go to curiositystream.com slash historymarsh or scan the QR code for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for our fans, use promo code HISTORYMARSH and you will save 25% off. So click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash historymarsh and save 25% right now. Perhaps few men in the dark days of the April of 871 would have envied the task before King Alfred of Wessex. The last living son of King Ethelwulf, himself a scion of Egbert, the founder of their line, indeed the survival of both Alfred's house and of an independent Wessex, hung by a fragile thread. With two of the major Anglo-Saxon kingdoms conquered, part of the great heathen army had infiltrated south in late 870, though not without incident. With his elder brother and king, Alfred had fought four battles, being bested at Reading and later Basing and Meriden, though the brothers battered the heathens into defeat at Ashdown between the first two. Indeed, Alfred had certainly proved his mettle as both a warrior and leader, holding his own with his smaller force just long enough for King Ethelred to enter the fray and complete the victory. For his heroic courage and defense of his kingdom that day, the young Ethling earned his sobriquet, the Wild Boar of Ashdown. Yet despite their success, the heathen army was far from vanquished. Though reduced at Englefield and Ashdown, Halfdan's men were reinforced by the timely arrival of a great summer army. Compounding their misfortune, King Ethelred himself was wounded in a later battle and died of his wounds by April of 871. Alas, the beginning of Alfred's own kingship was not marked by some great decisive victory in the field. Just a month after his accession, the king fought a hard, day-long battle on a hill above Wilton. Despite his grit and undoubted courage, Alfred and his people were being ground down to defeat. Following Wilton, Alfred sent word to Reading that he would buy his peace. Though not outright admitted, it's almost certain the king won his peace through a substantial payment. However, this process would not have endeared him to his own folk. After decades of raids, the southern English economy was flat, the coinage of the kingdoms debased to the extent that peace was likely bought with portable items such as crosses, chalices, rings, and torques, among many others. 
Having wrung what they could from the battered West Saxons, Alf Dan and his men withdrew east to London. Yet if the West Saxons had initially given them a bloody nose, any such concern about King Burgred's Mercia would have quickly evaporated. Burgred was keen to buy off the heathens once more, rather than endure any battle, and perhaps similarly eroded his own authority and support that much more as cartloads of precious goods flowed into occupied London. Yet as 872 progressed, the invaders would not have it all their own way. The puppets installed in conquered Northumbria had been overthrown. Client King Egbert and Archbishop Wolfhere of York fled into the arms of Burgred in Mercia. However, though acting swiftly to stamp out resistance in York itself, the entirety of the heathen host was ominously not committed to the effort. Halfdan in fact moved the bulk of his men to Torxey in the former kingdom of Lindsay. The aristocracy of the area had, over time, been subsumed into the Mercian orbit through intermarriage, making Halfdan's choice of camp there alarming to Burgred. Continuing to receive tribute here, Burgred must have eventually concluded that this latest headache was not going to subside. Indeed, Halfdan had a plan for the meek Mercians. Having installed another English puppet on the Northumbrian throne, Burgred may have breathed a sigh of relief when informed Halfdan had struck camp from Torxey. However, his heart must have been in his mouth at the news of their destination. Having continually bled Burgred dry throughout 873, the invaders rooted themselves in the Mercian royal center of Repton. This act was a deafening message to both the kingdom and to the long-reigning Burgred in particular that his days were done. Despite his 22-year reign, the royalty buried at Repton were not of his dynasty. The implication was clear. They affiliated themselves with the older kings and even buried some of their own dead at the place. From Repton, waves of raiding continued to plague the kingdom, and with no serious resistance offered, King Burgred ultimately fled to Rome, along with Alfred's older sister, Ethelswith. As in York, the invaders favored installing a puppet for the time being, described as a foolish king's thane. Having now toppled three of the four major Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, the great heathen army brooded throughout 874 on their next move. Halfdan felt his future lay in the north, and with a portion of the army headed to a base on the Tyne, from where he could attack the Picts and the Celts of Strathclyde. Meanwhile, the rest of the army, now under the trio of Guthrum, Ossetel, and Unwend, headed south to Cambridge. Yet unfortunately for Alfred, Guthrum had designs on this last defiant kingdom. The first ominous sign of a resumption of war was a naval action in the summer of 875. Alfred himself led his men against seven enemy vessels, capturing one and driving the others to flight. A small victory to be sure, but one soon overshadowed by a much greater threat. At some time either later that year or earlier in the next, Guthrum's army made its move. Alfred had not been negligent of the danger, as is indicated by timing of the invasion. West Saxon scouts had long observed the enemy camp. However, Guthrum ordered the advance into Wessex during the night, and given Alfred's swift mustering of the feared to resist them, the arrival at Wareham was impressive. Guthrum's occupation of Wareham must have been both a shock and humiliation to Alfred and his army. Around 140 miles from Cambridge, Guthrum thus successfully avoided direct confrontation, riding through the heart of Alfred's domain and now occupying this important royal center. Yet as audacious as this was, Alfred could have been forgiven a moment of confused amusement, as now his enemy was battled up deep within his own heartland and far from overland supply. However, 
Appearances were deceptive as news soon trickled in that a large Viking fleet had been sighted off the south coast. With the scales balanced so, Alfred once again turned to negotiation to rid Wessex of his foe. As in 871, an agreement was reached that Guthrum would leave the kingdom, the usual hostages exchanged, and the deal sealed with an unusual pledge of faith. Whereas before the heathens had sworn upon Christian relics, this time Guthrum swore upon his own people's holy ring. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, this was something never before conceded to any folk. Another source, Ethelward, suggests a more unbalanced arrangement in which payment was once again offered to encourage their departure. Whatever hopes Alfred may have had following the talks, though, they were shattered at the news of Guthrum's swift betrayal. Instead of marching back to East Anglia or Mercia, the enemy moved by night west to Exeter. The ancient walled city provided further shelter to the invading army, but may also have presented a greater threat still given Guthrum could potentially link up with disaffected Cornishmen to the west. The Cornish were certainly no friends of the House of Egbert, their father suffering defeat at Hingston Down decades before. Certainly a new Viking-Cornish alliance was not entirely unthinkable. Whatever Guthrum's plans, however, Fortune's wheel now scuppered them. His fleet setting out from Pool Harbor had been smashed to bits in a storm of truly biblical proportions. Barely a few miles into their voyage, a great storm struck the 120-strong fleet near Swanage with a loss of all hands. At a stroke, Guthrum's leverage vanished. Encircling Exeter, an enraged Alfred, now reassured he was in the right, now had Guthrum over the metaphorical barrel. The Chronicle reports that Guthrum conceded as many hostages as Alfred demanded, and specifically men of enough import to deter another reneging of their agreement. So, by the summer of 877, Guthrum and his army finally retired from Wessex. At Gloucester, within Cheerwulf's Mercia, Guthrum activated the previous arrangement agreed after Repton. Part of the kingdom would remain under Cheerwulf, with Gloucester itself and the east distributed among Guthrum's men. This cultural and legal splitting of the ancient Middle Kingdom would endure for centuries, Watling Street effectively setting the Dane law boundary in the immediate future. Back south, Alfred may have thinly hoped the dismantling of Mercia had satisfied Guthrum, but if so, he was to be brutally corrected. Previously, though negotiations had eventually forced Guthrum's withdrawal from Exeter, the heathen leader had been in no great hurry to depart, his occupation lasting several months, and it's entirely possible that during this period, Guthrum entertained the more disaffected elements of Alfred's subjects. Up to Christmas of 877, Alfred had survived as the last remaining free king of Anglo-Saxon England through a mix of grit, bribery, and good fortune. However, where brute force alone had failed him in the past, Guthrum also now employed deception to oust the last free king. Alfred's payments to the enemy, while expedient and, in the short term, effective, also inevitably alienated some of the Witan, upon whom the burden would fall to provide payment. Events came to a head at Chippenham, which Guthrum, with his characteristic stealth, fell upon during the Twelfth Night Christmas celebrations. By the time of the attack, Alfred and his closest followers had fled. As it is later recorded that Alfred survived alone for some months, we can assume no support sufficient for the king to immediately muster the feared in response to Guthrum's attack. Asa himself describes Alfred's state of existence following Chippenham. King Alfred, with his small band of nobles, and also with certain soldiers and thanes, was leading a restless life in great distress amid the woody and marshy places of Somerset. 
He had nothing to live on except what he could forage by frequent raids, either secretly or openly, from the Vikings, as well as from the Christians who had submitted to the Vikings' authority. Whether or not treachery in the West Saxon court was afoot, the result was undoubtedly the same. With Alfred and his few remaining followers fleeing from Guthrum, the entirety of Wessex was now at the pagan warlord's feet. With his men overrunning Wessex and the leadership of the king effectively neutralized, thoughts of Alfred skulking across the channel in imitation of Burgred's flight may have occurred to Guthrum. Indeed, as a writes, this was the fate of many nobles during the time, choosing flight to the fight. It's true that such a devastating setback would have broken most men. However, King Alfred was not most men. During the earlier months of 878, far from succumbing to defeatism and despair, Alfred fought back as much as he could, biding his time in his fastness of Athelney. Despite military defeat and treachery, he was still the king of Wessex, and during this time, Alfred sent messages throughout Wessex, gathering support from those unwilling to bend the knee to Guthrum and his collaborators. He was going nowhere, and he would fight for his crown. It was also during this lowest ebb for Alfred that the legend of the burning of the cakes originates. Yet if this incident really did occur, it certainly marked Alfred's nadir in fortune. As had happened near Swanage with the enemy fleet, God would once again thwart a finishing blow to the house of Egbert. Guthrum had not merely rested on his laurels and planned a two-pronged push into western Wessex. Now Ubba, the brother of Halfdan, would sail from southern Wales to land behind Alfred's position, while Guthrum himself closed the trap from land. It was a decent plan, but had not reckoned on the actions of one who had remained loyal to his king. Odda, the elderman of Devon, had rallied his men to the defense of Wessex in the previous weeks, and settled his force at the stronghold of Kinwit. Oba, with his fleet of 23 ships and around 1,200 men, landed nearby and set about encircling Odda. Apparently convinced the Saxons would be forced into surrender given the lack of water on the hill, Odda nonetheless gave every impression of hunkering in for the siege. In truth, the Alderman had a simple plan. In the distance below, perhaps he saw the Raven Banner bold and menacing in the breeze. As Halfdan's warriors had done to his lord at Reading, so Odda would sally down in a surprise attack. His target was that banner and the person of Ubba himself. So it was that Odda's charge smashed into Ubba's ranks, and indeed around 800 of the invader's army lay dead. Ubba himself was among the slain, and now the sacred raven banner was in the hands of one of Alfred's loyal eldermen. The slaying of Ubba, last son of Ragnar, must have chilled the hearts of Guthrum and his host, while inspiring those of Alfred and his men. It must have been an unambiguous beacon to arms for the battered loyalists of Wessex. If not before, perhaps more and more messages of support began to flood into the Alfredian camp, and as winter gave way to spring, it would be Alfred who struck the next blow. Asser writes that, around the 4th to the 10th of May, Alfred rode to King Egbert's stone on the eastern end of Selwood. Alfred would be forgiven for holding his breath as he approached the mustering point. Could such a reversal in support from the betrayal of Chippenham be possible? Greeting him as in answer, were some 4,000 men of Hampshire, Wilshire, and Somerset, all who had answered the call. Camping at Selwood for a night, Alfred moved to Eiley the next day, the location of another well-known gathering point. Perhaps Alfred meant to bolster his army further. 
Guthrum himself marched to intercept him at a place called Eddington. As with Ashdown several years before, the exact location of one of the more important battles of English history is not known for sure. Whether at Eddington Hill or Bratton Camp itself, Guthrum awaited Alfred's onslaught. Frustratingly, Asa skimps on the specific details of the action that day, though he writes, Alfred moved his forces and came to a place called Eddington, and fighting fiercely with a compact shield wall against the entire Viking army, he persevered resolutely for a long time. At length he gained the victory through God's will. Though describing battles of this period as long-lasting is quite typical, we have no solid reason to doubt this. If Guthrum's warriors held the ground advantage, but the feared had that of numbers, the fight could easily have devolved into an hours-long slugging match. The fighting then was likely long and hard, the two tightly knit shield walls hacking away at each, the scrum of sword, shield and muscle shifting to and fro until finally chinks began to fracture Guthrum's line and the momentum decidedly shifted into Alfred's favor. With his warriors faltering or simply determining that defeat was certain, Guthrum must have decided to call a general retreat. That the melee of battle swung decisively to the West Saxons is plain. As a writing, Alfred destroyed the Vikings with great slaughter and pursued those who fled as far as the stronghold, hacking them down. The aforementioned lines imply much damage was inflicted before the general flight, and without the death of Guthrum himself, we can assume a major breach in the line or a severe drop in morale that preceded the collapse. Though inflicting heavy casualties before pursuit, Alfred mercilessly hunted the remnants to the very gates of Chippenham itself. Alfred's wrath may have been understandable. For months he had been a fugitive in his own lands, perhaps forced to flee by treachery from within the ranks of his own great men, and had now snatched victory from the very precipice of defeat. Fortune's wheel now revolved full circle. Surrounding Guthrum's remaining men within Chippenham, the West Saxons killed any man caught outside and seized all goods and animals in the vicinity. Encamping at Guthrum's doorstep, Alfred settled down, content to wait for either the surrender or starvation of his foes within. Two weeks into their ordeal, Guthrum finally accepted defeat. Unlike earlier encounters, there would be no negotiation or talk of hostage exchange. Guthrum alone would yield what hostages the king demanded and would receive not a single coin in payment. In addition, Alfred required Guthrum and his leading men to convert to the Christian faith. With little choice, it was agreed. Just three weeks after the siege had concluded, Guthrum was indeed baptized, close to where just weeks before Alfred had languished in internal exile. The event was more than just a spiritual conquest of the Christian god over Guthrum's pagan idols. Alfred too was demonstrating his own earthly superiority over his defeated foe, sponsoring Guthrum himself, acting as godfather and conferring precious gifts on him and his lieutenants. The later treaty of Alfred and Guthrum divided up Mercia between Danish and West Saxon spheres, an arrangement that would endure. For Alfred, it was better to have a reformed friend than a dead pagan enemy. Alfred recognized Guthrum as the Christian king of East Anglia, and he would indeed rule East Anglia as Ethelstan, this arrangement granting Alfred and Wessex a crucial relative peace in the years to come. Though other Viking incursions would have to be faced, the long reconquest of former Anglo-Saxon lands had only just begun. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. 
You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.